to our beginning. Welcome to the first of our new series called Travelling Light as we go through the book of James. Uh, how many of you, like me, have been to the airport and you prayerfully put your bags upon the weighing machine and uh, you stand there in shock and horror when you know full well it was going to be over as the, uh, the booking lady or, or gentleman there uh, raises an eye and looks at your bag and suggests that you've got too much baggage. How many of you have been there before? Yeah? Yeah. Every time I go to the airport, we've learned our lesson, but every time we go to the airport, there's always somebody there um, trying to unpack and repack their, their gear, you know, and they're trying to get you know, 20 kilos worth of gear into their 7 kg limited uh, personal carry-on. You've seen that before? And then you try to walk like it's really light, uh, and when you put it up, the cabin thing just about sinks. Or the alternative is that you see people in the middle of summer walking around with three jackets on, like this. This is a goodie, isn't it? You know, uh, this is normal. This is normal for me. I always walk like this. Yeah, and they sit down and like this, and they peel stuff off, all because they got too much baggage, too much baggage. And the reason why we're calling this series "Traveling Light" is because, like a check, check in at the airport, we're wanting you to check in over the next 12 weeks ideally with a small group, ideally with a life group, and work through what James talks about when he suggests that we travel burdened, overwhelmed sometimes, and overweight because of the things that we carry within our spirit. And so therefore, this morning, we're going to begin this series looking at the first few verses of James, and I trust that it gives you a good introduction into this book that we're going to enjoy in the coming weeks. This, uh, this talk today is called The Road to Wisdom. The Road to Wisdom. It's in that traveling theme. And uh, what we're going to find here this morning is that right at the beginning of James' talk with the churches is that he sets a tone and a scene and he sets a pace by which we're going to discover things that he has for us. So the road to wisdom is a journey. We all know that. And the word journey is probably overpopularized these days because everybody's on a journey, everybody's going somewhere. And so journey can be a little bit overused. But this road to wisdom, as James describes it, is a journey of repentance. That's the overarching theme that James calls us to. It's not something of a word that you will find popping out of the scripture all the time, but it's implied in everything that we look at here. And repentance is a beautiful doorway. It's not a threat. It's not intimidation but it's a doorway of hope. You see, the, beauty th- about, the beautiful thing about repentance is that um, when you're called to repentance, God gives you the power to change. That's the beautiful thing about repentance, is that when God says, hey, I want you to do a 180 here, I want you to turn around and do something different to what you're doing now, because what you're doing doesn't work. It isn't part of the kingdom value or the kingdom attitudes. When you're called to change, God gives you the power to change. And so it's not something that you work on in your own strength. It's not like you white-knuckle your way through the challenges. But the beauty is repentance gives you the power to change, the ability to go from here back to there. And so that's implied through this whole story. And I want you to keep that in mind. I'll remind you, but I want you to keep that in mind over the weeks ahead. So James begins with these words. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, Greetings. Now, like any scripture, there's just so much. And the introduction here is not unusual, but it is a little bit short. Uh, we're going to see this in a little bit more in a moment. But James here describes himself, himself as a servant of God. Uh, to be more literal, he's describing himself as a bond servant, a bond slave. And some of your Bibles will have that description. And to be a bond slave or a bond servant meant that you have voluntarily surrendered your life to serve this family or this household. Slavery in the times of the Romans and the times of of the Hebrews was a very common practice. It wasn't slavery in the derogatory sense that you have now. It meant that you were in servitude, in service to a household. Now, sometimes if you got yourself into a fix financially, you would have to indenture yourself to that family for a period of time, maybe years, where you'd work for them because of a debt that you might owe them. Other times you were born into slavery and therefore you were given freedom at time, 
when you deserved it or earned it by your master. But here, what James is describing himself to be is a bond slave, somebody who has voluntarily gone to the master's house and he said, I wish to submit my life publicly to you. In other words, in a public way, he's declared that he will work for this person for the rest of his life. And Leviticus tells us that when a person chooses to do that, the household owner, usually the man in the house, would take this servant, take him to the doorway of the house. This sounds a bit unusual, but he would take the the, uh, servant's ear and push it up against the door frame and would put an awl through it, like make a hole in in his ear. Okay, now the idea wasn't to leave him there, because there's not much use if he's just hanging around the door. But um, that hole put, put on that door frame uh, has a lot of spiritual significance, simply because every year the blood of the lamb was put around the door as an act of, uh, of, of forgiveness, as an act of repentance, as an act of the household's own servanthood towards the lordship of Yahweh, God. And so when that ear was pierced in that place, it meant that that person had indentured themselves for life, to serve. Now, James isn't the only one who calls himself a bond slave. You'll find also that there's Peter, there's Titus, and Timothy also refer to themselves as bond slaves. So it was a pretty common term, but it really sold the idea that you were committed totally to the service, in this case, of Jesus Christ, to the service of Jesus Christ. James, a bond slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And then James goes on to talk about how he's writing this letter to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. And this is a really important point to pick up here because we'll see what the troubles are that this group is facing. But we need to remind ourselves that the 12 tribes have scattered simply because of the persecution that has taken place in Jerusalem. We know that things went from good to bad quite quickly when a uh, a certain... uh, disciple by the name of Stephen was testifying to the resurrection of Christ and the crowd was incensed by his proclamation that Jesus is Lord and they stoned him to death. And then it said great fear came upon the city that day and the disciples spread. And so this spreading, this scattering, this church that is now being seeded throughout the other nations is what James is addressing. Okay, He's talking to that church who through persecution have been scattered now amongst the nations. And he knows, and this is again in his first, his first opening lines, he says, you are having your faith tested. Okay? Why? Because you've been pushed out of your home. You're now identified as somebody of the way, as it was called. The early church was called the way, the way of Jesus. Okay? And so here's this church that is now broken from its original moorings in Jerusalem, And it is now on some waves, some waves of doubt, some waves of trial. And it's no longer what it was, but it's going to be more than it ever could have been by being spread amongst the nations. Okay, so we've got ourselves a start here. But before we go any further, I just want to ask you a really simple question. This is is James talking to us here in in these uh, verses. James, the brother of Jesus. Or should I say, the half-brother of Jesus. Okay, because Jesus was born in an immaculate way, conceived miraculously by the Holy Spirit. So technically, God is the father, Mary is the mum. James is the product of that union between Joseph and Mary. So therefore, Jesus is James' half-brother. I just ask a simple question of, What would it take for you to stop one day and recognize your own brother or sister as being the son or daughter of God? That would be quite a challenge, wouldn't it? Yeah? Most of us, with all that sibling rival we're growing up, the last thing we'd ever think is that they are God's son. And so I ask this because this letter that James is writing, he's writing about his brother. Okay? Okay? A guy that he grew up with, went to school with, worked with, did the chores with. And Jesus didn't really get off to a very good start with his family. Because we find in Mark chapter 3, at one point, Jesus is talking to the crowds. And somebody said to Jesus, hey, uh, your family are outside. 
and uh, the allu- they're alluding to the fact that the family wanted to take Jesus home. That's what you do when you've got somebody in the family who's saying they're the son of God, don't you? You take them home. Yeah? Would you do that? It's a really nice way of saying, we think Big Brother has lost the plot. Okay? Uh, Jesus turns and said, who are my family? My family are those who do the will of God. Okay? So he redefines family, and that's the first instance that we ever see of him talking about the church, really, the people who do the will of God. Who, and so here we find that the, the starting place for Jesus' ministry to his own family was, dare I say it, rather thin. But here we are some years later, some decades later, James is referring to his brother as the Son of God. That's a huge transition, isn't it? That's a massive jump. And I think it's one of those things that gives credibility to Scripture and gives credibility to the whole story of Jesus. You just think of what it would take for you to call your brother or sister divine, the son of God, or we could say the daughter of God. That is a, a quantum leap, isn't it? And I think it gives credibility to the whole testimony of Jesus is that somebody would call their own brother the son of God. Wow. So, Normally in a letter that is written to the church, and as we've seen this in other letters that we've read in Scripture, the welcome and the affection and the shared journey that people have had with those who are receiving the letter is often talked about. You know, I write to you with great affection. I pray for you. I want to be with you. These are the opening remarks of most letters. But not this time. James seems to be a little bit more to the point. So, a simple greeting, this is James, this is who I am, and then he gets stuck into it. And his opening line, I think, is, is enough to take your breath away. And he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Now, I have to admit, when I first read this passage when I was a Christian, when I became a Christian in my early 20s, this was a real head-scratcher for me. It, didn't make sense. I thought, James, you're nuts. You know, one day I'll get my head around this, but right now, this doesn't really make a great deal of sense. You know, because I interpreted it like this. Oh, the dog died. Praise the Lord. You know, take joy in your trials. I thought everything had to have a hallelujah on the end of it, regardless of how difficult it was or not. But James is talking to us about a bigger picture here. And it's this big picture of life that you've got to get your head around. James is talking to a persecuted church that has now been persecuted for a number of decades. Okay, So the trials and the tribulations that he's referring to here are trials and tribulations of persecution. Of course, we will have trials and tribulations, not all of them persecution related, but they will be certainly challenges to our faith. And so what James is saying to us here is that we are to give joy and we are, sorry, to to greet a trial with joy and to have happiness about the fact that we're going to discover something about the character of God that we didn't know before we had this trial. Count that as pure joy. Pure joy, I I think, has some images. Like for me, yesterday um, I took a wedding between Joshua Luiz and... um, his wife, uh, <laughs> Nadia Cruz, and, uh, and they've grown up in the life of the church here. They've, uh, they met at a uh, youth group. Uh, lovely couple, fantastic ceremony, joy, you know, that picture of joy uh, as these two committed their lives together. Uh, maybe joy when a, when a baby is born, you know, there's this, that absolute amazement of the miracle of birth, Okay. That's incredible. Um, another thing that brings joy, and I'll put it out there, maybe I'm just a silly old man, but I saw a video clip on, on Google a while back on YouTube and had about 10 minutes worth of babies, like little toddlers, little ones, laughing, laughing uncontrollably. And you can't help but smile because you just see their joy and they just bubble, you know, this absolute pure innocence and, and the, the beauty of that is they just giggle and laugh and you anyway it's it's a it's one of those beautiful things so that's pure joy now it's really hard to translate that sense of feeling across to 
a trial that you're having. But James is wanting to describe to us something that is above and beyond the everyday challenge and trial of life. He's wanting to say, look, let's just grab the big picture here for a moment. He's buying into the fact that these listeners of this letter will have already had experience, experience difficulty and they would have already seen for themselves that some of their trials have led to some pretty amazing outcomes. Okay, read the book of Acts and you'll find what I mean by that. As the church is scattered, there is amazing outcomes, miraculous events, and families and villages are transformed. And so here we have James saying, look, take joy in your trials. Here's a quote from uh, an author called Robert Mulholland in a book called Invitation to a Journey. He says, spiritual formation is the process of being conformed into the image of Christ. Okay? That's not too complicated, is it? Spiritual formation. Uh, I've used this illustration before, but it's a helpful one. Uh, when When an artist was asked how he shaped this big piece of marble into the image of a beautiful stallion rearing up on its back legs. He says, well, you think it looks hard. For me, it was easy. He said, I just chiseled off every bit that didn't look like a horse. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, that sounds really easy, doesn't it? Makes us all artists in our own imagination. But what's being said here in the comparison is that when God is working in our life, what he's trying to do is to chisel off every little bit that doesn't look like Jesus. Now you know why life can be difficult. Yeah? Because as we commit ourselves to this journey of Christian life, the goal of God is to transform us. Not to, to make us all one like robots, but to take our individuality, our, our own wiring, if you like, and subject all of that to the work of the Spirit and the Word so that we too can become more like Jesus. That's the trick. That's the goal. But there's something about this quote here from Mulholland, which I have to add to, because this is only part of the quote. The second part of the quote has five other words, and it goes like this. The testing of your faith produces perseverance. Okay, we're going to get our guys up there who's going to sleep. Um, There we go. Yay. Thanks. For the sake of others. All right. So spiritual formation is the process of being conformed into the image of Christ for the sake of others. In this world where individuality is worshipped and my individual rights are to be preserved at all costs, the reason why we're being shaped by Jesus is for the sake of others. Now, this shouldn't surprise you because all of us, in one sense, train. All of us learn, get educated, set ourselves tasks that are designed to live within community. So if you have a passion for school classes and teaching, the likes, you train to be a teacher. If you're the sort of person who loves to create things, you might be a builder. If you have... uh, an ability in certain other areas, you'll go and allow those skills to take you on a journey. And it's always for the sake of others, isn't it? For the sake of others. Because without others, you wouldn't be able to take your skills and apply them. And so the beauty of this is about how much the challenges is going to actually give you the ability to be more skilled. You find that people who are taking themselves through a really difficult training process they are going to be able to offer specific skills to people in ways that others won't be able to. But the beauty of doing this is not just the skill that you bring, it's the process of perseverance that you go through. You see, we all know that if you wanted to study to be a certain profession, the work of the study and what you learn is only part of the process. I think a big part of the formation for somebody who's learning a particular skill is the discipline of the learning itself. I know when I did a degree at university, uh, for me it was the late nights trying to crunch out an essay 
you know, trying to get something so that it made sense, not only to me, but to those who are going to read it. Yeah? The challenge of being a student, of course, you, you're living on the smell of an oily rag because you had not so much money coming in. Um, the disciplines there of, in my case, having a young family at the same time. How do I balance all of that time? And so it goes on. And so these are the things that we learn for the sake of others. And that creates a sort of stamina within you. And this is what that perseverance is all about. You see, James is saying it's all about the perseverance that you learn as you go through the trial. And that capacity, that persevering capacity, is what James is wanting to celebrate. It's a little bit like an athlete who might complete a marathon And you go, wow, that's fantastic. You completed that marathon. What a great result. Well, the result might be good, but the real work has already gone in for hours and hours and hours on the road prior to the event, isn't it? And so you develop a physical stamina, a physical capacity to persevere. And so it is with trials. Trials give you the spiritual capacity to persevere. What might have tripped you up when you were younger won't trip you up when you're older because you've been able to learn to persevere and you realize that there are ways in which God does things which are higher than your ways. And you can say to yourself, I've been here before. This is difficult, but this too will pass and I will be able to see the bigger picture of what God is doing right now in the future. And so you come to understand that time is your friend and that the journeys that you're on are familiar to others and yet they might be new to you, but you're going to learn that and discover that for yourself. <clears throat> Many of you appreciate that um, Michaela and I did this walk across the top of Spain, and then I was crazy enough to do it again the following year. The, um, this is a trial, 800 kilometers, but it's a trial that we chose to go on. A little bit like, bit like going to university. It's something that you choose. Now, interestingly enough, Uh, We've got some friends of ours who live in Perth who started this walk uh, six days ago. And we've been reading their blog. They've been writing up every day what they've experienced. And um, um, it's exactly the same sort of story that we went through. They're talking about having sore feet, sore legs, sore back, um, staying in hostels where everybody snores, all those sorts of things. And so... What they're doing is they're going on a trial, if you like, taking on a trial that they have chosen. The biggest challenge that we face is how do we respond when the trial we're facing is not our own agenda? Could be a trial of health. Could be a trial concerning your business. Could be a trial concerning relationships. Could be a trial concerning some doubts in your whole area of faith. All of these trials are things that you didn't choose or you'd be deemed to be foolish to choose because these are difficult times in your life. It's in these times, in these moments, when you need to allow God to work in your life. And your experience will tell you, as you have more experience, that time can be your friend. You need to allow God to work in your life during these times of trial Because at the end of that period of time, you know that God is going to have gifted you something that you didn't have before. And that's where faith comes in. In the moment, in the heat of the moment, you go, oh my God, literally, how is this happening? Why did this happen to me? But over time, you get to see God's hand in it. And we we struggle with these these events in our lives because um, we simply don't know how to control the outcome. You see, we like to be in control. Dare I say it? Men even more than women. You know, that holding on to the remote thing? It's really a part of the spiritual journey of a man. One day he will surrender it when he has been perfected into the image of Jesus. But we want to be in control. And so when you go and do what we did and go on a Camino we were in control. If it got too hard, we could catch a bus and come home. All right? That would have been the worst outcome from my perspective, but it was a potential outcome. When you're not in control, 
That is when you have to hand over the whole problem or the whole challenge to God. That's putting things in his hands and having to learn to trust that he himself is going to take care of this challenge. And when God is involved in this, then there's going to be an outcome that you probably didn't expect. And these are the times when you feel really, really weak. When men, you feel like you can't fix the problem. You're used to fixing problems. That's when you go home and your wife tells you about your day. You just rattle off all the answers and life is sorted. You wish. It's not the case. I can remember when our our son-in-law passed away. We were sitting around a table and it was one of those moments when um, we were all feeling really, really sad and I sort of took a step backwards from the situation and created some objectivity to the whole thing. I think it was a gift really that God gave me in the moment to try to summarize in my own head and heart what was going on here. You know, what's happening with our family? Of course, we were grieving. But this image that I had was us sitting around a table, and it was like half a dozen people sitting around a table who all had their bank accounts overdrawn and were trying to see if somebody could give them a loan. Emotionally, we were all wiped out. None of us had the emotional capacity to really be there for each other. We were all in overdraft. And so in those moments, you realize there's actually only one answer to this. That's, we've got to pray. We've, we've got to actually take strength that doesn't belong to us and invite God into that process and that trial. Then God becomes real. Then our strength is not our own or borrowed from somebody else. It's our ability to be able to draw from the source of all life and he gives to us in our time of need. And so when we respond to the agenda that's being set for us, uh, that is when God is actually in the bigger picture. And James says, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Now that's just as much a big promise, isn't it, as the idea of having pure joy at your trial. You know, you're being told here that you'll get to a point where you're not lacking anything. Now I don't think that lacking anything is to be interpreted too broadly, but what you're really being told here is that your ability to travel the distance, to go the journey until you meet with Christ yourself, through these persevering trials, you'll get to a point where you're not lacking anything. Come what may, come hell or high water, you will be able to handle those challenges and those problems. Because why? You've developed spiritual stamina. You've developed spiritual perseverance. That gives you the reserve and the the ability to be able to get to the other end, still with your faith intact. And the fact that you go through through these trials is actually about others. You realize that you become a doorway of hope for others. When people have gone through difficult times and they have made it through, they have sort of touched the bottom, if you like, and they know that there's no no hole in it. It's solid. Your faith is solid. When somebody else is going through a similar trial, you can, you can point to that doorway and say, look, there is hope. There's another day. There's another year. Things will get better. Things will pass. And your experience, because of your own perseverance, now becomes part of the whole helping process that God wants for his church and for, for those around us. See, the, the beauty of being on the road for a little while is that you have 2020 insight, probably better put as 2020 hindsight. Wisdom comes from this journey. And our ability to be able to persevere in different forms of trial gives us the ability to be able to say, this too will pass, and I will be richer for it. And the beauty of that, when that's done repetitively, is where I think James kicks in and says, look, we can actually rejoice in this difficult time. Because we know by experience that God will have the final word. And even though it's not our plan, God will be glorified if we allow him the the room and the space to be able to work in our lives for that effect. Does that make sense? Yeah. You see, God always has that bigger picture in mind. And faith allows us to see the bigger picture, even during times when everything is just so confusing. And the weaknesses that you feel that you have they become the connection points for other people who are going through the same sorts of trials. 
So, James then goes on to say, and this is hitting us pretty, pretty quickly, isn't it? It's like, a, it's like drinking from a fire hydrant when he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Now in that verse 5 there, there's something really important for us to see. See, one of the things about having a relationship with Christ is that when you know you're not doing as well as you should, that's a nice way of saying maybe there's uh, some sin in your life and you're not proud of that. One of the traps of the enemy is this. He says to you in your conscience, look, you don't have the right to talk to God about your problems because the problem that you have, God's not pleased with you. And as a result, who are you to go and ask God for help? All right? That's one of the things you have to overcome in your Christian life is that feeling of worthlessness. But that's why James says here, very deliberately, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. How do you break out of this circle of feeling guilty and not asking? You have to know that God is the one who actually says, I will give generously to you even when you're stuck in the challenge that you're facing or the sin that you're in. I'm not going to judge you because you're coming to me for help. In the same way that a father or mother wouldn't judge their own children when they say, Hey, look, I'm really struggling with this, Mum, Dad. I know you're not pleased with me, but I need your help. Okay, a parent is not going to find fault and say, how dare you ask me for your help when you've got this problem? That just doesn't make sense, does it? God's in the same category as that. He won't find fault with you. In other words, he will deliver an answer. He will give generously to you, even though you might feel that you're not worthy of it. And that's, that's, that's how our relationship with Christ works. God loves us first so that we can actually join him in the process of learning to be more like Christ. But here we go once again. This this whole idea of our attitude having to be in the right place to receive an answer. Um, James says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Look, this is, I'm going to try to explain here the human condition when it comes to our problems. You might have a problem with some money, okay? You might have a debt and you're struggling with it. So you say, God, I need help with this problem. I need some money. Okay, let's keep it really simple. But then what you do is you start giving God alternative options. Okay, God, um, I know what I'll do. I'll get another house, a cheaper one. Okay, there's an answer. Uh, No, I'll I'll, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, um, I'll get a better paying job. I oh, know I know what I'll do. I'll, um, I'll sell the car and downsize that. No, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll move out of the city to another city because it's cheaper there. And you start offering God all of these alternatives. We all love to be God's little helpers, don't we? Okay? And that's perfectly natural. We're trying to rationalize things. But we have to be able to stay in one place long enough for God to hit the target. Does that make sense? You can't have doubts about God and the way that he's going to respond to you. God will work in your life in areas where you have doubts, where you have challenges, where you have needs, but you have to give him the room to be able to make that, that, that target available to you. Otherwise, you'll just end up being, as the Bible says, tossed like the ocean, tossed like the waves, be double-minded. And this is where James is saying, look, none of us are going to be any good to anyone if we're just making this up on the, on the fly, if we're just double-minded, have different solutions, different ideas. We've got to be able to come to God with our problems and stand and say, God, I need an answer. I need an answer. Okay? One of the things about this wisdom that James is talking about is it's a wisdom that comes from experience. One of the tensions that we face in today's world is that we've got lots and lots of information. Okay? Mr. Google gives us all the information we need. But wisdom cannot be found on Google. Oh, yes, you might come up with some wise sayings if you look for them. But those wise sayings, unless they're grafted within you, are not going to create wisdom in your life. 
So I remember reading on uh, Caleb Fryatt's wall in his office when he was working here, it had um, understanding is to know that tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing that you don't put it in a fruit salad. Okay? Yeah, that's pretty simple, isn't it? Um, but when you're talking about this wisdom versus information, we have all this information available to us, but how we apply it is really what authenticates us as Christians. Now, I read a while back that it takes 2.3 million parts to make up a 787 Dreamliner. And not one of those parts can fly. Okay? So there's some information. It takes huge wisdom and experience to knit 2.3 million parts together to allow a plane to fly. Does that make sense? Of course it does. And so it is we're inundated with information about everything you possibly want. But it's the bringing together through life experience and perseverance and trial and pain and conflict and, and maybe long extended periods of, of not understanding what's going on. That is where the parts of your life are built together and shaped. That's where wisdom comes. The reason why James is so emphatic right up front about this need for wisdom in the midst of our trials is because trials create wisdom. And wisdom gives us the ability to see the world from God's perspective. And that's what is being shaped into our lives, is the ability to be able to say, here is the world I live in, here is the world that is to come. And I confuse the two together because the person of Christ gives me the ability to do that. Therefore, I don't just live with this world in mind, but I live knowing full well that heaven awaits, that eternity awaits, and I don't have to have it all. And my trials are, are, are helping me with the thing that's most important to God. That's the shaping of my spirit, the shaping of my life, the shaping of my attitudes. Okay, so wisdom is the accumulation of all those tough experiences that you've had, those hard-won lessons in life. You know, we have lots of those, don't we? Our health, our health will ultimately fail us. Ultimately, we die. You know, finances, they can be a real trial. You know, keeping a business alive is a real challenge. Maybe, you know, working for a boss who doesn't appreciate you, that can be a challenge. And then one of the craziest things we do is that, you know, a man and a woman who have completely different views on life, fall in love and marry and spend the rest of their lives sharpening each other. Isn't that right? That's a mystery, isn't it? Even the Scriptures tell us that. But you see, trials are our friends. That's what James is ultimately saying. Trials are our friends. And yet we live in a world where we act more like a tourist rather than a pilgrim. You know, a tourist wants to go through the country and just see the highlights. Show me all the best bits. It's very easy for us to go through Scripture in this way, or as Christians, just pick out the best bits. This is the life I want to lead. All the promises of God, all the best bits of God. But pilgrims, they go up the mountains and down the mountains. Their feet get wet, they get covered in mud, they get rained on, they get hailed on, showers come, drought comes as they go on this journey. And through those trials we are perfected when we invite Christ into all of those challenges. I remember many years ago, a friend of mine uh, turned up at the home group that we were, we were leading, Michaela and I, and uh, he says, oh man, he says, uh, sorry I haven't been around for a while, I hadn't seen him for about six, eight weeks. And I said, oh, what's up, Paul? And he goes, oh, you know, I've been going through a tough time, so I thought I'd just lay low. I'm like, why would you do that? That's what we're here for. Why do you lay low when you're going through a tough time? That's the time when we should be together trying to share some love and wisdom and experience. But the way the world thinks is that I've got to be on my game. Yeah? I've got to be doing this whole thing perfectly. And, that, and that's the reason why we've invited 
you to get involved with a small group during this season of three months looking at James. Because we know that when you're on this journey and you want to travel light, you've got to be able to share those experiences with others and say, hey, look, you know, I'm burdened by this. How do you offload that? How can you share your wisdom with me? But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. Again, hard-hitting words from James. eh? He doesn't hold anything back. He says, look, if you're going to be double-minded, if your head's all over the place, if you're going to do this tomorrow, that the next day, if you want God to answer this prayer, or maybe that one, but you've got three ideas and you don't know what to do with either of them, how's God supposed to work with that? You know? I mean, the worst thing God can do sometimes is actually answer our prayers. Is that right? He's like, oh, goodness me. You really know what you're asking. Double-mindedness is this inability to stand and actually say, okay, I've got a challenge and God's asking me to work through it. It's a relational problem, maybe. That means I'm going to have to have that, that cup of coffee with that person. I'm going to have to be as honest and tactful as I possibly can. You know? Double-minded person go, ah, I can make a new friend tomorrow. I don't need that person. Or if you've got a problem with your business, you might need to find others who have done this journey before. Get some help. Get some coaching. Get some mentoring. Or you say, ah, i just get another client. I'll get another customer. Those are the easy ways out, but those are the double-minded ways. And God wants us to be more solid than that. He wants us to be able to take what we have in front of us and see it as the challenge that he's given us and work it through in such a way that we change and we grow and we learn from those experiences. And then we become a wealth of wisdom, a wealth of experience, a wealth of love. And we hope, hold open that doorway of hope for other people. So that's what this James series is all about. That's what we're going to, to, to head towards. Um, and just as some alternative reading, I just put this up here because I think this is a really good book. It's called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction by Eugene Peterson, the guy who put together the message translation. And this book here will help you if you're interested in some supplementary reading. Okay? Uh, you, can, you can buy it anywhere as you can these days, particularly on, on the net. Um, it's sort of book you sort of buy for the title, really, eh? You like to stick that on my bookshelf there because the title tells you pretty much what this journey involves. A long obedience in the same direction. And so James invites us to that as well. And so I'm inviting you to 12 weeks of this series and I just ask that you take this season really seriously to remember that the gift of God that overlies all of James is this gift of repentance. Not only the challenge to change, but the power to change, the capacity to change. These are the promises that God has made to us, and we find them being outworked and fulfilled in James. Let's stand for prayer. <clears throat> Lord, we know we can't escape this world without facing trials. And... Um, Forgive us for even thinking that that's the case. Lord, we know that uh, for many of us, we've been through significant shaping because of difficult times. But you test our faith, Lord, to give us the capacity to be able to persevere, and that not just for ourselves, but for the sake of others. That in the trials that we face, uh, we have discovered a fresh view of Jesus. We see him as the suffering servant who was perfected under trial himself, and we enter into that tradition. And so, God, I just want to pray that over these coming months, uh, we will find joy in the journey. We will find that in our trials, we can see the bigger picture, the ability to be able to hold on to scriptures, to hold on to Jesus, and say, God, we can see how it is that you're changing us, and that you're le leading us through 
uh, something that we would never have chosen for ourselves. In these things, Lord, this is where faith exists, in those dark gray areas where there doesn't seem a right or a wrong, there doesn't seem to be an up or a down, there doesn't seem to be a yes or a no, but there's often a wait. Just wait. Oh God, help us to hang on to you. And Lord, I pray for these, these groups that have started, or are starting this week, over 30 new groups in the life of our church, where new relationships are going to be forged, new friendships are going to be built, uh, new revelation of your word is going to be shared from from the word itself and from life experiences that, that are there. And I just want to pray your blessing upon all of those and, uh, and for all that, that brings into the life of our church. So, Father, we, we commit ourselves to this journey with James. And uh, we just ask that we can be pilgrims for this season who get to live your word on a daily basis. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.